novelty, which is my term for complexity or advanced organization, novelty increases as we approach the present moment. The universe you and I are living in is a far more novel and complicated place than the early universe was. Well, some people would say, well, that's just a consequence of the unfolding of developmental processes. But this asks the question, what are developmental processes? Why should the universe have a preference for order over disorder? Especially when we have something called the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us exactly the opposite. Physicists believe the universe is running down ultimately into a state of disorder. But what I see is everywhere the emergence of more and more complex forms, languages, organisms, technologies always building on the previously achieved levels of complexity. So that was one of my insights. Coming out of that insight was the further understanding that this process of complexification through time is not proceeding at a steady rate. It actually follows a kind of asymptotic curve. In other words, it's happening faster and faster. And this was a revelation to me because it allowed me philosophically to contextualize the human world and to understand that human technologies, languages, migrations, art movements, ideologies are not something different from nature. They're the same uh, download of process that we see in the movement of continents, the evolution of new species of animals, except that these human novel emergent situations are happening much more quickly. So I see the cosmos, if you will, as a kind of novelty producing engine, a kind of machine which produces complexity in all realms, physical, chemical, social, whatever, and then uses that achieved level of complexity as the platform for further complexity. Well, this explains our present circumstance. It explains the rush toward all forms of new technology and social organization in the new millennium. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that if the universe is complexifying faster and faster, an a epoch, a time will come when this rate of complexification is occurring so rapidly that it will become itself the overwhelming phenomena in the world of three-dimensional space and time. And I call this the omega point or the transcendental object at the end of history. And I believe it is not that far off that with the emergence of a global internet, a human population of several billions, an electronic noosphere, uh, that we are now within the shadow of this transcendental object at the end of time. Our religions sense it. That's what gives them their apocalyptic intuitions. And I think the ordinary man and woman in the street sense a kind of built-in acceleration to time itself. Well, rather than dismissing that or treating it as a psychological perception or something unique to our society, I took it as a basic perception about physics. So what we have here is a, a new model of time based on a very real intuition that I think most people share, which is that time is speeding up, that human beings are part of that process. Whether you believe that we can know the precise moment of this transformation of the world of time, or whether you believe it is simply coming soon and fast, really doesn't make that much difference. We are all gathered here at the end game of developmental processes on this planet. We are about to become unrecognizable to ourselves as a species. Uh, our technologies, our religions, uh, our science has pushed us toward this for thousands of years. Which lasts longer? A million years in which nothing happens 
or 10 seconds with 50,000 events crammed into it. In other words, uh, uh, really time is only experienced by the events which occur within it. And I maintain that the early universe had very little going on and consequently uh, time moved very, very slowly. Uh, the character of time as we approach the present is that there are more and more uh, what physical domains and energetic domains in which change can occur. For example, the early universe was a pure plasma, a pure swarm of unassociated electrons. You didn't even have atomic systems, let alone chemistry, molecular chemistry, life, complex speciated life, and uh, dynamically balanced planetary ecosystems. Each one of those more complex phenomena crystallized out or emerged, if you will, from the previous uh, uh, systems that had come into existence. So when I say time is speeding up, what I mean really is that more and more is happening more and more is happening. And if you ask the question, well, what would be the ultimate state of connectivity or of happening? It's when all points are connected to all other points. Somehow this concept of connectivity is intimately linked to the concept of complexity. And so really what I'm saying is that the universe is getting its act together. It's connecting the dots. It's bringing everything into co-relationship with everything else. And somehow it does this through the production of consciousness. Consciousness is this integrative function in biology which takes data which may appear profoundly unrelated, and in fact brings it into some kind of a congruent relationship. We say an organism coordinates a point of view. Well, in a way, what's happening over time is that the universe is coordinating a point of view. And as it does this, it becomes somehow more aware, more self-conscious, more uh, being-like and less thing-like. And as I said, this process is not proceeding at a steady pace. It's proceeding faster and faster. More connectivity occurs now in a calendar year than occurred in a million years, a billion years ago. So sometime, somehow, as we approach the present, we find ourselves in an ever-denser realm of activity, interrelationship, connectivity, and the result of this is more of the same, producing a shrinking globe, ever more immersive technologies, a dissolution of political, social, gender, and class boundaries of all sorts. So that's what I mean when I say the universe is speeding up. You know, before the advent of, of man, of human beings, the fastest changes on this planet of any consequence were genetic changes, changes in the genomes of plants and animals. Well, biologists know that for a fruit fly to add a spur to its leg, for a bird to change its plumage, you need hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of years of evolutionary time. With the advent of human beings using spoken language, a, a new kind of possibility was born. It's called epigenetic change. In other words, change which is not about genes, but which is about uh, languages, customs, behaviors of human beings. Epigenetic change reaches its uh, dramatic culmination in speech, writing, uh, and communication of all sorts. And so the carriers of epigenetic change, the human beings, are automatically then the carriers of accelerated novelty. And so when you look at, let's say, evolution on a coral reef, 
and you compare it, let's say, to the evolution of political ideas in modern Europe, obviously modern Europe's rate of change in this domain is thousands of times faster. So by moving from the genetic to the epigenetic realm, we have vastly accelerated all kinds of processes. Now we appear to be about to move from the strictly human domain to the human machine symbiosis domain. And of course, machines process information, make connections and do their work at a rate thousands of times faster than any human being can work. So we see again a progressive acceleration of the process of creating and maintaining varieties of connectivity. And that's what I mean by time is speeding up. Visualize for a moment sand dunes and notice when you look at these sand dunes in your mind that they look like wind. Sand dunes look like wind in some sense. Well, then analyze the situation. What is wind? Wind is a pressure variant phenomena that fluctuates over time. Uh, in a way, the sand grains moved about by the wind are like a lower dimensional slice of the wind itself. And from photographic analysis of dunes, you can calculate the speed and duration of the wind that made them. So the dune is a lower dimensional slice of time, of the wind ebbing and flowing that made it. Well, now let's change the metaphor a little bit. Instead of grains of sand, let's think of genes. Instead of a windstorm, Let's think of a billion years of evolution. It moves the genes around in a pattern, which is a lower dimensional slice of the force which created the situation. In other words, on every living organism, there is the imprint of the higher dimensional force which made it. Now, somebody could say, well, that's God. Well, but in a scientific context, we don't speak like that. But whatever it is that made blind matter into whales, squirrels, and human beings, it left its calling card inside each human being, each squirrel, each whale. That's the DNA. You know, in the 19th century, if you spoke of nature having a purpose, uh, you were thought to be anti-evolution because in the 19th century there was great pain to eliminate anything like preformation or teleology or purpose or God, all these things that were, they were trying to eliminate from evolutionary theory. And until very recently in scientific thought, the idea has been that uh, Events are pushed by the causal necessity embedded in the events which preceded them. In other words, if you ask the question, what is the most important event in terms of, sh or moment in terms of shaping this moment, the answer would be the moment just before this moment, because it hands on the, the energy, the space, the time. Recently, mathematicians have evolved what they call the notion of attractors or strange attractors in some cases. And these are processes where uh, a dynamic is not pushed by causal necessity from behind, but it's pulled by a point in the future. So I uh, have always doubted that evolutionary theory without purpose, without teleology, could produce as complex a world as we see around us in as short a time, five billion years 
as the life of the earth. It seemed more as though these processes were not just wandering across a flat genetic landscape. They were, the, the process of biological evolution was actually being channeled between high walls. In other words, it could move, it had some motion this way, some this, but its forward direction was uh, inevitable. And this is the idea of an attractor, that what the universe is doing is it is under the sway of what I call the transcendental object at the end of time. And that is this domain of hyperconnectivity, that it would be perfect novelty. And all nature aspires for this state of perfect novelty. You could almost say that nature abhors habit, and so it seeks the novel by uh, producing various kinds of phenomena at every level in biology, chemistry, and society. And so there really is a purpose to the universe. Its purpose is this state of hypercomplexification in which all of its points become related to each other, become what mathematicians call cotangent. And it gives the universe the feeling of being imbued with a caring presence. It makes it appear as though nature is tending toward something and that our, and it changes our own ethical and moral position in the universe. Because, you know, science tells us that we're the products of a cosmic accident. We're at the edge of an ordinary galaxy in an ordinary star system, and we're damn lucky to be here. And that's it. That's our place, a very existential notion of our place in the cosmos. But if you take this other point of view, that process is under the influence of an attractor and that the value the attractor is maximizing is novelty, then suddenly, for the first time in 500 years, human beings are moved back to the center of the stage because we are the most novel thing on this planet. We are everything biology is plus technology, language, politics, philosophy, art, so forth and so on. So suddenly human beings become important, not mere cosmic witnesses to a meaningless cosmos, but the cutting edge of a cosmos that glories in order and is moving toward higher states of order. And at the present moment, we are uh, the carriers. Once it was the volcanic processes that shaped this planet. Once it was the life of the early oceans. Once it was the great dinosaurs. But today, humanity represents the cutting edge of complexity and uh, this process of moving toward complexification. So it, without invoking God or any sort of uh, uh, myth, you give meaning to human life. What is man's purpose? To advance and preserve novelty. You know, this is an ethical position. It means you don't replace rainforests with pastures. You don't censor books. You don't uh, lean on people who make gender choices different from yours. It, no, the purpose of, of being a human is to complexify reality even more, to hand on a more diverse, more complicated, more multi basic universe to our children. And when this process of complexification reaches the omega point, uh, it, it, will, it will fulfill, I believe, the expectations of all of these religions, but it will fulfill it in a mature, scientific, and uh, universal way that these religions all lack because they all reflect their parochial origins. I'm always trying to visualize what the concrescence would be like, even though I know that in principle it's probably not possible to imagine it. But several factors are on the horizon which I think can be brought together to sort of get a picture of what we're headed toward. One is 
are, for some time now, we've been involved in building complex prostheses, which we call machines and computers. They are part of us. We don't perceive them as part of us because we identify with the flesh and exteriorize the the fabricated metal. But in fact, they are a part of us as much as our political systems, our agriculture production systems, so forth and so on. So we, the animal body has reached the limits of its evolutionary abilities. A cheetah can run 75 miles an hour, an elephant can lift three tons, and so forth and so on. To go beyond those capacities of the animal body, you have to make a marriage with mechanical things. So uh, we are extending ourselves through the machines. Well, one of the things that these machines do is their time compressors. Uh, you know, you and I sitting here talking are operating at about 100 hertz. If we could be magically downloaded into a top-of-the-line computer, we would run at 800 megahertz. That means we could do 800 million more things in this moment than we can do when we're wearing flesh. So it may be that we will find a way to technologically stretch time and this will become for us like a false eternity. You may have only 10 minutes left in your life, but it may be time enough to pack in all of human history from the fall of Rome to the present moment. So we are finding ways out of the three-dimensional Newtonian prison, which says, you know, life is narrow and confined and ends at the grave. And it's, we're doing it by becoming information that is freed from material. And somehow this allows us to make this ascent to the next dimensional modality. Information is not uh, time and space constrained the way we are. We talk about the difficulty of moving uh, uh, an object at the speed of light. Our entire planetary technology cannot achieve moving a marble at the speed of light. But we can move information at the speed of light tetrabytes of it. We do this every day. So we see, aha, we stand then like children at the edge of the ocean of information and we're putting our feet in and wondering, you know, could we swim in that? What would it be like to be wet in that? What would it be like to go into that new medium? A similar dilemma must have confronted the early amphibians as they stared at the land and said, you know, could we leave the ocean? Could we go up? into those places? Could we breathe air and actually make the transition to such a hostile and alienating environment as the land? And so these are major symmetry breaks. But in every case, the answer has been, you bet. And sooner or later, somebody did it, and then all succeeding generations uh, have followed suit. What is fascinating about this particular transition is that we are conscious of the implications. We who will make the transition will in some sense, some limited sense, understand its implications, where I don't think that was true for the animals that left the primordial ocean. They simply were behaving blind instinct and evolutionarily dictated behaviors. But the degrees of freedom accessible to us are so uh, multiferous that we can actually appreciate for the first time our circumstance. And our circumstance is awe-inspiring. I mean, we are about to take the step out of matter. The planet is on a collision course with the most profound event it's possible to imagine. The freeing of organic life from the chrysalis of matter. For a billion years there's been life on this planet, but never life that could step outside of matter. But this is obviously what's in the cards and we are privileged to be central to that event. Obviously, we're on the brink of building computer-assisted worlds that don't 
quote unquote really exist, but the, which we will experience the way we experience dreams or the imagination. And I think this is where psychedelic substances come in. Shamans have always entered into a, a non-physical realm of information through trance. In a way, there's nothing new here. Is it a unique, is this ascent into novelty a human thing? No, part of what I discern here, though we humans are always ready to suffer guilt and take blame for everything going on in the universe, I don't believe this is something we are doing. I think that we are as much corks tossed on the ocean of time as are hummingbirds and uh, prairie dogs. In other words, a, an event of cosmic significance and importance is going to occur not far in the future. Are we causing it? No. Can we stop it? No. Can we hurry it? No. It's built in to the structure of matter itself. One way of thinking of this is that the laws of physics are evolving to permit greater freedom. And we are, and people have said to me, well, don't you find it a little strange that such a momentous event would occur uh, in human history? After all, human history is 10,000 years wide. The planet is 5 billion years old. Pretty unusual coincidence that human history would be happening when this cosmic event happens. No, that's completely wrong. Human history is being caused by the nearby presence of this event. In other words, if you think of the event as something which has shells of influence, some of its shells of influence reach so far back in time that they drag life out of the primitive oceans. Some of its shells of influence reach so far back in time that they define the emergence of the hominid line out of the higher primates. Some shells reach back to Egypt some to medieval times. As you approach the present, it becomes stronger and stronger. But I would argue that the presence of human civilization on this planet is the strongest evidence we have that matter and organizational processes are about to make some kind of a leap to a new order of being. What, what history is, is the 25,000 year transition zone. Before you enter the zone, you're an animal. After you leave the zone, you're a god. But for 25,000 years, you're kind of an animal and kind of a god. And you're constantly being swamped by your animal nature, and then great teachers are appearing and dragging people back to the right line. And we are schizophrenic in history. If my ideas seem strange to someone, I ask them, can you imagine this planet in 500 years, given the propagation of ordinary historical and scientific rates of uh, unfoldment and discovery? Can you imagine this planet in a thousand years? No, no one can imagine that because processes are now in play which so totally rewrite the script that no one can imagine a hundred years or two hundred years in the future because the discoveries which will be made in that span of time will so totally rewrite the human experience of itself and the environment that we cannot see deep into the future. And this indicates to me that the future is exploding in an asymptotic uh, unfoldment into a kind of cultural superspace. And, uh, and our own bafflement at the impossibility of conceiving any real future given the political and social and technological forces in play is proof of that. There is a way of looking at the entire 20th century, beginning with Pablo Picasso bringing masks back from Africa and showing them around in French cafes in 1915, uh, beginning with Freud's discovery of the unconscious and Jung's elaboration 
of those discoveries. And then every phenomenon of major importance that you care to mention in the 20th century, fascism, abstract expressionism, rock and roll, sexual permissiveness, psychedelic drug taking, uh, rave culture, body piercing, jazz, the list is endless. What do all these things have in common? They are reversions to, arc to archaic behaviors. They are, represent rejections of the Edwardian gentleman with his white man's burden and represent instead a realization that for us to survive and live with ourselves, we have to re-empower archaic values. As the century unfolded, the understanding of what this re-empowering of archaic values might mean has changed. Jung and Freud discovered the unconscious, discovered that we are not all ladies and gentlemen, but that there is a cannibal lurking within. Um, Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD demonstrated that that inner wilderness is accessible to most people through chemistry. Well, then still later, it was understood that the, the key ingredient in active shamanism is psychedelic plants, psychedelic experiences. And in a way, that closed the loop between the impulse toward the archaic and the impulses of, uh, of modern science and modern medicine. Uh, the key is the psychedelic experience. That's what makes the shaman a shaman. That's what made the archaic in fact archaic. And so people like Freud and Jung and the Surrealists and the Dadaists and the Abstract Expressionists, all of these people were very close to the mark. The shaman is the paradigmatic figure and the psychedelic experience seems to be the anticipatory experience of, of this eschaton that we're headed toward. You know, when psychedelics were first being discussed, it was thought that they would prepare people for death. In a sense, they probably do. But in the same way that they prepare people for death, they prepare people for transformation. It gets you used to the idea that the world is not what it appears to be. And it gets you used to the idea that the world is somehow animate, intelligent, and proceeding along its own agenda. So in a way, shamans have always been anticipations of some future state of mankind. They're the masters of language. They are the ones who are telepathic with the animals. They are the ones who can see into the future. So this archaic nostalgia gets real focus once you realize that it is the shaman and his or her shamanic techniques that confers on them the extra historical dimension, that that is how you get out of linear history. That's how you visit the realm of the ancestors. That's how you travel into the future. That's how you break up the tyranny of Newtonian serial time. I think it's just going to get weirder and weirder and weirder. And I look for the invention of artificial life, the cloning of human beings, uh, possible contact with extraterrestrials, possible human immortality, and at the same time, appalling acts of brutality, genocide, race baiting, uh, homophobia, famine, starvation, because uh, the systems which are in place to keep the world sane are in utterly inadequate to the forces that have been unleashed. Uh, the collapse of the socialist world, the rise of the internet, these are changes so immense nobody could imagine them ever happening. And now that they have happened, nobody even bothers to mention what a big deal it is. Uh, the fact that there is no such thing as the Soviet Union, people never talk about it anymore. But when I was a kid, the, the notion that that would ever change was beyond conceiving. Uh, so the good news is that as primates, we're incredibly adaptable 
to change. Put us in a desert, we survive. Put us in the jungle, we survive. Under Hitler, we survive. Under Nixon, we survive. We can put up with about anything, and it's a good thing because we're going to be tested to the limits. This is what it's like when a species prepares to depart for the stars. You don't depart for the stars under calm and orderly conditions. It's a fire in a madhouse. And that's what we have, the fire in the madhouse at the end of time. This is what it's like when a species prepares to move on to the next dimension. The entire destiny of all life on the planet is tied up in this. We are not acting for ourselves or from ourselves. We are, we happen to be the point species on a transformation that will affect every living organism on this planet at its conclusion. The great watershed difference between the archaic understanding and what is called scientific materialism is the archaic mind understood in fact perceived that nature is conscious nature is alive nature is an organism full of intent uh, the goal of the archaic mind is to connect with communicate with and align itself to this greater Gaian holism which is sometimes called nature the great spirit the realm of the ancestors but this is what the archaic uh, mind understood and was comfortable with and in fact it is true our own uh, decision to view the universe as dead as inanimate as unintelligent allowed us permitted us to dissect it use it and uh, and uh, deny its validity outside of human purpose. Now the consequences of living like that is coming back to haunt us. You know, we have almost destroyed our home. We have almost cut the earth from beneath our own feet. So this impulse toward the Gylanic and the, and the archaic is uh, a survival instinct. At this point, we must give uh, reverence and credence to nature and nature's methods because no other methods will allow us to work our way out of the present mess we're in. Uh, high temperature, high energy resource extraction, commodification, uh, mega agriculture, we're at the end of the rope for these things. So the archaic holds answers, but it only holds answers if we are willing to think of the universe as a living, intelligent entity in with which we are in partnership, not set against.